an assistant vendor at Vassal Lake Bird Observatory, and we have Matthias Dieber, who is vendor in charge. And today we have a quick outline on the next slide um, of the things we're going to talk about as part of this presentation. So we'll start with introduction to Vassal Lake Bird Observatory, where it's at and what is that we do there. Uh, we can go back to outline. Thank you. Uh, we'll talk about bird banding process, uh, and then we'll tell you why and how we band birds. Matthias will share with you some summer of the collected data, and then he'll tell you what happens to the data. We use it more for. And at the very end, he will find information on how to get connected and learn more about the station in your own time. Okay? So, last week, Bird Observatory, how many of you have been there? Yay! Almost all of them. Good, that's very good. So, this is a project we're working on the European Conservation Alliance, and it's a bird migration monitoring station. On the next slide, we can see where it's located. So it's about, you guys all know, because you've been there, but it's about four kilometers south of, of, of Northern Falls, just off the Highway 97. And uh, the station is located on traditional and city territory of um, still Okanagan Nation. And it's also coordinated by Canadian Wildlife Service as part of um, National Abraso uh, Report Wildlife Protected Area. And on the next slide, you will see this is a map of our station setup. So the red outline gives you a full area of VLBO. That's the point of survey. In blue, I don't know if you can see well, this is the trail that we use for bird observations and also for census. In yellow, you will see the location of some of the nets that are set up on the station. And the area itself, even though it's in the south of Melbourne, it's not the dry grass. It's a wetland complex and we have uh, stretches of riparian sites and also marshes and we have that set up in different habitats so we can catch different types of birds. Okay, so we'll go to the next slide. So I'll give you a little bit of a station background. We started in this location in 2001 and in 2006 we picked the sites for the nets and they've been consistent since then. So technically this year was 21st consecutive year of uh, migration monitoring in this location, which is quite a lot of data. And um, we operate daily from August the 1st to October 15th. We actually just finished our field season last Friday, which is very exciting. And today we'll give you a bit of an update what we saw at the station this year. Um, we ban during, during the mornings, usually from sunrise to noon. So if um, anybody is interested in coming to visit us, during the mornings would be the best time to do so. You can go to the next slide. And so what does migration monitoring actually involve? There's three components in how we collect our data on birds. First of all, of course, is misnetting, catching birds and bending them. That gives us a good estimate of how many birds are actually out there and we can catch. But then we also do census, which is basically um, assessing how many birds are there by sight and sound. It's done for an hour and a half in the morning, one hour after sunrise. And a good vendor who knows almost 100% of all the bird species of the station can go on the trail and record all the different birds that are out there. Now, during the day, because we spent almost seven to eight hours at the station, we also record daily observations. They could be big birds flying over. We're definitely not going to catch those, but we want to make note of them, as well as any other wildlife that we see. We've been lucky to see some bobcats and moose and snakes, and so we want to keep note of that too. Okay? Bird banding. So because you've been to the station, I presume you know what bird banding is, but I'm still going to give you a bit of an introduction to that. Basically, it's a temporarily ca capture of birds for tagging them and then release. It's a type of a research technique for um, capture mark recapture survey methods that is frequently used in ecology. Next slide. To catch birds, we use specifically designed nets. They're called mist nets. We don't use any lures. We don't use bird feed or you know, calls, nothing like that. It's a passive mist netting effort. We have 14 nets set up in total at the stations, as I said, in different types of sub-habitats. And we go to check those nets regularly. Every half hour, we come into the net and we see a bird, we extract it. And you can see a photo here of Matthias untangling the bird from the net. And it's probably one of the hardest parts of bird banding. It's actually getting the birds out of the net. And so for bird extraction, we, you know, we have to be super careful, but once the, bird, once the bird is out of the net, we put in them in those special bags, you can see in the picture on the video, right? And they're just made out of kind of pillowcase material. They're very soft, they're breathable, and we use those bags to transfer the birds from the nets to the bending stage, okay? And then once we're at the bending station, we do the most important thing is we tag the birds. 
that gives us a way to identify birds permanently with a very unique number. So there's some bird bands you can see on the left hand side. Uh, those are the ones that we use for bird banding here. And uh, they all have various sizes because of course birds have various size legs, right? So we have to match their leg size with the special band. And then we use special pliers to open up the band, apply it on birds leg and close it. It doesn't harm the birds, it's a very quick process, it's very easy to do. And the birds are just the perfect size that can go up and down on the leg and they don't squeeze the leg too hard. Uh, for some species, well, actually, in particular, yellow breasted chat in this area is an endangered species and there's ongoing research on that bird. And so, what we do, we also apply color bands. You can see in the middle picture over here. And the metal band is still there with the numbers. You can see on the left leg over there. But there's also three other colored bands, the green and the blue and the black, those are made out of plastic. They're very light. And the combination of the colors will tell us what individual it is. So that the next time when we see this bird in the field, we don't have to capture it. We can just assess it based on the, look, based on the color, color bands that it has in light. Um, so that's where it bend. Let's go to the next slide. Once we bend it through bird and apply the band on the slide, we have to collect all other information about each bird that we catch. So first of all, we start with aging and sexing. We want to be able to tell whether it's a hatchery bird or an after hatchery bird. Sometimes it could be tricky. And we, all, we always look at different types of characteristics depending on the species. Once we have that information, we also look at the fat and the mold. On the next slide, I will have some photos. If you're not yet, so you can go back. Um, well, I will have some photos now tell you more about how we do, uh, how we assess fat and mold. Then we also look for breeding characteristics for different birds. And lastly, we collect measurements on the weight and the weight. Now, can go to the next slide. Thank you. So here's a photo on the left hand side of Matthias processing black cap chickadee. And you can see on the table there's a variety of tools that we use for bird banding. For example, those um, little jars with uh, colorful lids, this is where we store all of our bands, right? With the varying size. Um, and then there's also different flies that we can use and rulers and tubes. So once the bird is caught and banded, we want to be able to look at the feathers, and that's what Matisse is doing in the photo there, look at the wing, at the tail, at the head. And then over here on the right hand side, at the very top, we have a volunteer zone you can use looking at the foot feather blowing under the feathers on the belly. And that helps us see how much fat there is on the bird and also check it to see if it's molting, right? If it's changing any feathers. And molting patterns are actually very unique in different species. So that's something that we always keep an eye on and always record when we process birds. Okay, now to, to measure the wing on the bird, we use a special ruler. You can see this very cat bird with the bottom photo. Somebody's measuring their wing. And then lastly, because birds fly, we can't really weigh them super easily. So we use those tubes. We slide the bird upside down in the tube for a very quick second. We weigh it in scale. And once this whole processing is done, the bird is good to go. So for those of you who've been to the station, you will notice that actually, even though there is so much information we collect, it only takes us a couple of minutes per bird. Sometimes even less. Now there is a hummingbird up top of the photo. Those guys are so small, Matthias has a special permit to bet them. So they might take a little bit longer, but just because they're so small, but they still collect all the same information um, on, that, on those species. Okay. So why do we bend birds? Well, of course we can collect a ton of information, but it's only useful if we can apply it to something in our real world. So first of all, we'll look at different physical, diff physiological differences between age and sex and different species. It's especially important for birds that are understudied, the species that didn't have much research put into that. We also investigate patterns and molds. We ourselves don't do any of the data analysis like that, but we supply our data to the shared database. And Matisse will talk more about how exactly our data is used. Then we can look at productivity. We can see how many hatch year birds, those that were born this year, compared to how many after hatch year birds are there, right? So is it a good year for breeding or is it a bad year? This is something that we can look at in our data as well. We can look at survival. If we catch a bird that was a hatch year this year, we fly the band and we see it next year, we know it's surviving migration. We know it's doing well. Because often enough, there's a very high mortality in juvenile birds. So for us, looking at those trends is very, very important. And lastly, there's also recruitment that we can look at. And that's something to do with if there was a hatch year of birds, it migrated south, came back in the winter, it became reproductive. That's a good sign. That means that there's going to be a new family build up and there's 
more uh, birds going to be in the population. Uh, so yet another important characteristic to, to research. We can also look at the changes in the population trends and demographics, look at the migration flyways. This is particularly important when all the other vending stations that follow the same protocols. And if they catch the birds that came from our station, we know exactly where the bird went and how it changed during this migration flyway. We can look at habitat associations. As I said, we have nets set up in different sub-habitats, and we can look at where certain species like to go, right? Maybe they like more willows, maybe they like more open areas. And it's something we can record as well based on the net location. Overall, of course, all this information helps us understand birds better, but more information for science on birds, but also conservation. And even though we're very science-focused, we also are all about our and we invite people to come and observe science in action and be part of it. So if we go on the next slide, one of the programs that was launched in 2015 is this immersive experience for kids when they come into our station. There's usually about up to 10 schools that visit the station on, on a yearly basis. They get to come in and watch the bird bending process. They check the nets with us. They see how, better, how uh, birds are caught. They also learn about bird migration, and different adaptations that birds have. So this is a very cool opportunity to teach younger generations about the science of birds and also conservation. Okay. Uh, we're also open to different group visits. We often get hiking groups, community groups coming through, and this is a very exciting opportunity for us to engage with local community and also to show what is happening locally in South Auckland. Because it's uh, only one station that is constantly and regularly running in this area. Okay. And lastly, we host annual open houses. We often get over 100 of people, and I'm sure some of you have visited us during an open house. And this is a way for us, again, to get to know our community, but also it's a way to collect some donations um, to support the work on the station. With that, I'm going to pass it over to Matthias, and he'll tell you more about the data use and some of the trends that we've observed. Thanks, guys. Okay, thanks, Anna, for that amazing introduction. Can you all hear me okay? All right, um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the data, the data that we collected and give you a bit of a review of the last three years that Anna and I have worked at the station, kind of show you what we found there and some of the birds that we've had the uh, privilege of capturing and working with. Um, so, next slide. So this is sort of an overview of, of the last 10 years of data that we've collected. I realize there's a lot of numbers up here, um, but I just want to draw your focus to a few main areas. So these are some of the metrics that we use to, um, I guess, monitor and compare kind of the numbers from year to year. So overall, like total number of birds banded, that's pretty straightforward. This square on the side highlights the last three years as well as the station average. So on average, we've banned about 2,000 birds a season. But you can see if you look at the early years, 2011, um, it was much lower than that. On average, we were getting maybe 15, 1,600. And in the last uh, few years, we've been getting a lot more than that. As well, uh, we have the number of species banded second year. So on average, about 63. Um, going down a little further, the birds recapture. So those are birds that we've already banded that capture again, which happens quite frequently. It's usually about 20%. If you look down here, the recapture rate is about 20 21%, something like that. And the birds per net hour is an interesting uh, way to compare because it also incorporates the effort. So the a net hour is basically one missed net that's open for one hour. And that's variable because some days either we have rain or weather or uh, wind interferes with the missed netting process, so we're not able to open for the same number of hours every year. So that, that metric kind of changes, and this number allows us to compare uh, more accurately using the, the effort as well. So this year, for example, we had 0.47 birds per missed hour, which is pretty good. It's above the average of 0.38. But again, the last few years have been quite high. 2019 was our best year ever, and 0.83. And then overall, the 21 year summary, so since the station started in 2001, since then we've had over 37,000 birds, um, 116 species. And again, overall, the average is about uh, 1,700 birds and 60 species. And this, of course, is the kingfisher deer in the photo there. Okay, next slide, please. So this is um, kind of a timeline of the last three seasons. So it compares the number of birds banded on this side to the date. Uh, so we have the three different years, 2019 in blue, 2020 in yellow, and 2021 in red. 
than the average of black. So you can see uh, 2019, like we said, was the best year we've ever had. There's a lot of really high peaks in that year, including this one really high one day, one of the biggest things we ever had. 2020 uh, started off really well. Like the yellow we had, we had a lot of really busy days early on, and then it sort of petered out toward the end. Uh, in contrast to that, 2021, this year, uh, we started really slow. And we were actually pretty concerned early on because we weren't catching as many birds as we had been recently. Uh, but then once migration kind of kicked in, mid-September is usually the peak, we got some really good days. And even toward the end, we had some pretty good days, much higher than average. So in the end, we actually ended up with a pretty good total. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a similar graph, but it shows the cumulative number of birds banded overall. So it's just all the days added on top of each other. Um, so again, 2019, here's that huge year that we had way above and beyond everything else. Um, 2021 is in the red, so and the black is the average. So it started quite slow and then passed the average and actually finished pretty slowly. Um, yeah, next slide. So now I'll talk about each of the last three seasons in a little bit more detail. So 2019, record numbers all around. We banded almost 3,700 birds. We recaptured almost 1,000. So overall, we had about 4,700 birds in total. Um, most species ever banded 71. And we set record numbers for 20 different species. So for 20 different species, we had banded more birds that season than we had ever had before. And we also had record totals for the months of August and for October. Next slide, please. So here's some of the highlights from that year. We had a really uh, interesting uh, northern strike at the very end of the season. It was actually in the net with a, a bowl, a small rodent that it had caught. It was dead, but it was in the net with the bird. Uh, we have this American Kestrel here. The first time we've ever banded one of those. And also purple finch, the first time we've ever banned in a purple finch at the young year. Some other highlights from that season. So this was that really big day that I kind of showed you on the graph. That was the, the final net run in our group of our little team that day with, with some white friend sparrows. Uh, we had a river sparrow and a clay colored sparrow, which are pretty rare countries, and this cooper top, which we do get usually just one of every year, but it's always the second time to get one. It's probably one of the larger birds that we catch. Uh, next slide. So moving on to 2020, some pilots from that year with this gross press to grow speed. If any of your birders, you probably know that uh, that species is not normally found here. They're normally east of the Rocky Mountains. So for that to show up here was pretty rare. It was actually the second time that's happened. Uh, we had a northern Sawin owl, which is really a rare species in the area. We've never caught one during the day before. We had done some uh, nocturnal owl banding in the past. We, we've captured sawbites, but never during the day. It was in the early morning. So probably just a little bit late getting to bed. Um, we have this large sparrow here. We actually caught two of them that season. Another pretty rare species. Not for the Okanagan, but for the habitat that we're in. They like the dry grasslands. Uh, this American tree sparrow, we had never caught one before, which is interesting because they do come into the area later in the season, but they're more here in the winter, so usually I think we're usually uh, closing our nets before they they make it into the area. And then the stellar shade is exciting because for one, we don't catch many of them. And this was actually a recapture that we had banded way back in 2014. We'd only ever banded four at the station. So it was really cool to recapture one of the four that we'd ever banded. And it was over six years old. And then finally on to 2021. So if you've been at the station, you've probably seen this board that we use to kind of keep track of all the birds that were Banding as the season progresses and it gives the visitors a good snapshot of everything that we've banded so far. And this is uh, updated with the final numbers of the season. So on the right here, uh, 2164, that's the total number of birds banded, 58 species, uh, we captured 550, and then 28 species we have. So you can see most of the birds on this list are filled in with a few gaps because some of them we don't catch every year. These are most of the birds that we would expect to catch at least one of every season, but of course we don't get all of them every year. Uh, and then there's a few on the side that are written in that are birds that we don't catch very often, but we had some this year. Uh, and the other wildlife that we see at the station we keep track of, as Anna said, so we have a black bear very frequently at the station this year. Lots of deer, river otters, lots of snakes, uh, some coyotes, weasel, beaver, muskrat, and forest frogs. So then kind of focusing on the most common species of the station, these are the top 10 birds that we've added this year. And this is a pretty 
pretty typical selection of birds that we normally get in the top 10. The orange crowned warbler, number one, that's the bird that we usually finish uh, with the most birds of. Um, 367 this year, so they're a pretty good year. The average is on the, the other side here. So the point uh, above average is season. Then going out the Song Sparrow, Audubon's warbler was surprisingly high on the list. The average is a lot lower. They had a really good season, it seemed. Uh, Lincoln Sparrow as well. White Crown Sparrow was kind of an anomaly. So the little star there shows that this was a record for that species. We had never caught that many before. As you can see, the average is only 36. Um, that's the White Crown Sparrow right here. So they had a really, really good year. We, we saw them moving through big, big numbers all the way through the end of the season. Common yellow crow, uh, this one here, they're sort of in order, uh, as the same order as the numbers here. Um, that one was a little bit lower, below average, so you're even higher than that. Then we have gray cap again, a little bit lower. Yellow warbler is pretty typical. Willow flankage are pretty typical. And then uh, unidentified yellow rock warbler was also a little higher than average. So that's a yellow warbler run warbler that we, we can't tell what subspecies it is. It's either uh, bird or not a bonus. Um, then I just wanted to quickly talk about the other aspects of our monitoring that Anna talked about. So we don't just ban birds, we also do census and daily observations, as she mentioned. Um, and this, this chart shows the number of species that we've uh, detected through each of those different methods over the years since 2010. So on average, there's, there's the means up here. On average, we, we detect 153 species overall at the station, uh, 132 through census and 121 through daily observations. So those numbers are obviously a lot higher than the number of birds we banned. We banned an average of about 60 because that incorporates all of the birds that we see. So ducks flying over hawks, larger birds that we don't really catch in the nets. Uh, and then in 2020, 2021, uh, we detected, I just did these, these numbers yesterday, 151 species, 24,000 birds overall at the station. Um, uh, just, so we can just go back a second. Uh, and then again, 2019 was a really good year for that as well, 155. Um, not a record, but pretty good for recent years. Um, I guess the highest year I'm here is sort of like 10 actually for another species. Okay, next slide, please. So, some of the very recent products we've had in 2021. Uh, we didn't catch anything extremely rare this year. The Red Star was probably the rarest bird that we caught. They do occur here on occasion, but not very often. That was the only one we managed to get this year. Old Crown Sparrow, um, we actually ended up with three of these. There are species that breeds more on the coast and, and in the mountains. So we don't see them in the Okanagan too often, but every now and then they do come into this area. Uh, we were really lucky one day to get a little trio, actually, the third one isn't shown, but of these golden crown kinglets. Again, there are species that doesn't really wander down into that kind of habitat. They like to stay higher up in sort of more coniferous forests. And they're extremely small and tiny and cute, so it was really nice to, to get them. Uh, and then another Stella Jay, this one was a new one, um, not a recapture, but again, not a bird that we catch very often because they are a bit larger and they don't love that kind of habitat. And they're just really cool to see up close the blue and the feathers. And it's just really, really mesmerizing. Okay, next slide. So then these are some of the most uh, interesting or notable captures overall since the season or the station has been going. Uh, probably the rarest bird that we've ever caught was this uh, black hat vireo right here. That's a species that normally breeds in Texas, Mexico, and Oklahoma. So it was way out of its normal range. Very surprising to see that here. Uh, 2008, and then black and white warbler. Another species of warbler that is pretty common out east, but in BC, you can really only find it in the northern part of the province. Same with black and white warbler, we have had two of those. 2002 and 2004. Uh, the Andrew Warbler, that's this really bright yellow one here. Um, another Eastern Warbler that really doesn't normally, isn't normally found east of Manitoba, I believe, or west of Manitoba. Uh, Ghost Breasted Rosebeak got it here. We actually had one uh, in 2020 last year, as we saw on the previous, on the previous slides, and in 2015. Um, Red Breasted Sapsucker, this one down here. That's another species that's normally found more on the coast. Um, Western palm warbler, another more eastern warbler, this one, and then purple finch finally got one from 2019. That's also not usually found in BC, or sorry, in so it's southern interior BC. Okay, next slide. So now we've talked about all of kind of the data we collected, 
talk about how we collect that data and what it looks like. So now I'm going to talk a little bit what we do with all these data that we've, we've spent many, many years collecting. So a lot of you have probably heard about this huge press release that came out two years ago, 2.9 billion birds lost since the 1970s. So there was a huge uh, an overview done of all different sorts of data sets that have been collected, including some of the data that we collect for banding data and migration monitoring data. And we found that almost 3 billion birds have, have we've lost 3 billion birds overall since the 19, since 1970, which is a huge, huge decline. Uh, and 2.5 billion of those are migratory birds lost. So decreasing 28% in that time. Okay. So continue on. So that's that's kind of one direct way that the data has been used. Um, sort of another supplementary project that we've been involved in is the Bird Genoscape Project. That's a really cool project that uses um, feather samples. So they actually, they can, uh, based on the carbon signatures in the feathers, they can determine where that feather was grown. Um, and we have contributed feathers to this project as well. So this shows the common yellow throat. And this study is, is out of the University of Los Angeles. So this is a map that they created based on feather samples they received from common yellow throat. So in purple, it shows the breeding range. Um, green is more resident, and then winter green is in yellow. So they can kind of map out really well where uh, the birds have spent time based on the carbon signatures and feathers that we've received. Uh, next one. And then this is another example of some MOTUS. You might have heard of that. Uh, it's a really important project that's picking up a lot of steam recently. It has to do with um, tagging birds with small radio tags. And then every time they fly by uh, MOTUS Tower, which are these small radio telemetry towers, it sends a little ping to the tower to show that this bird just passed by the tower. And in the eastern North America, they have a huge network of these towers now. All the little circles represent one tower. And this just shows uh, an example of um, bird pathways that have been mapped using these towers. These are examples of thrushes, the thrush, thrush, so I believe it's Pickles thrush and, and Swainson's thrush that were migrating south through this network. And in BC, we're starting to get more of these towers as well. Um, we're, we should be getting one at Vasso in the next little while. And once that happens, we'll be able to attach these little tags to birds as well as we ban them. So it's sort of an extra thing that we can do while we're banning birds to collect more data. Okay, next slide. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the Canadian Migration Monitoring Network. Um, Anna talked about this a little bit, and we keep saying migration monitoring. So this network is basically uh, a collaborative project between uh, Birds Canada, Environment Canada, and all the different stations that are, that are part of it. So they provide vital information on bird demographics and trends more than 200 bird species. And they contribute scientific data that advance the understanding of birds and other aspects of natural history in Canada. So I define migration monitoring as any standardized program of sampling migrants by capture or observation that is repeated daily and annually and has the capacity to contribute scientifically meaningful data that further the understanding of migration ecology in Canada. So basically, that's a lot of goal, but you go to the next slide. Uh, this, this map here kind of depicts the locations of all the different stations that are part of this. Network. We are one of about 27 stations across Canada contributes to this. Uh, so that's they are one of the, the partners that receive all of our data, um, and they use these data to do long-term population trend analyses. Uh, they have a 10-year report on uh, migration monitoring, and they're just working on a 20-year report now. That'll be out probably next year. So they sort of do 10-year increments on uh, trends that they uh, calculated. Kind of locally and nationally as well, nationwide. Uh, another big important aspect of this is is that we are able to monitor birds that are not commonly or accurately uh, assessed with other methods of the breeding bird survey. So a lot of the birds that we monitor, they breed really far up north in boreal forests or mountain forests, and those areas aren't very well monitored through other survey methods. So some of the examples of these include Lincoln Sparrow, Orange Crown Worm, or Swing Thrush. From the one of the Russian Wilson scoreboard. All right, so this is kind of what their data looks like. Uh, this is a portal online called Nature Counts, and anybody can access this and, and go on here and look at these data. So if you just type in Nature Counts into Google, it should come up. Um, so at the top, you can look at a few different uh, 
output. So the population trends, you can select the brain station, and then you can select the species, and this is what I'll show you. So at the LBO, since we started, this is kind of what yellow warbler trends been. Um, well, relatively stable, so it shows a negative uh, eight or a decline of 3.36 per year in 2001, 2008. Um, okay, next one. And then if you click on trend maps up here, it'll spit out a map of Canada. And these are all the different stations that have enough data for that species. So then you can click individually on each of these um, to show, to kind of get a, a more detailed look at uh, what's going on there. So, for example, McGill Observatory, you can see the down arrow that means it's declining. Mine is 8.61 per year. The, the, the big circles, the blue circles, kind of indicate that there's much of a change. Obviously, the green is an increase. So that's sort of a, a nationwide look at that species so you can kind of see what's happening uh, regionally in each, in each station. Okay, next one. Uh, another really important aspect of bird banding data uh, that we can uncover is bird longevity. So how long do birds live? Um, well, almost all of the data that uh, that we collected on birds and longevity that we know about how long birds live is from banding station. So some of the examples that we've seen in the last Few years. Uh, 2020, we had a great camper uh, that was banded in 2013 as an after second year. So that means it was at least eight years old. Uh, we had a yellow warbler in 2020 as well as after hatch year from 2013. So it was more than eight years old. And these are pretty common uh, recapture for us great campers and yellow warblers for some reason. They really like to come back to the same place year after year. Uh, the Stellarge I, I mentioned previously, uh, it was six years old. And we actually had a yellow warbler in earlier seasons that I wasn't able to find the data for, but we had 10 years, it was 10 years old. I think it was banned way back in 2004 or something like that. that and it captured almost every year through 2014. So that was before my time at the station. Okay, next slide. And then one of the last examples I have is uh, to do with productivity, which I had talked about a little bit as well. Um, so this is kind of what that would look like hatch year versus after hatch year. Comparing the number of birds that are, are young birds hatch years that were born that year from after hatch years. So for Brady Camper, if you look at the data that we've collected, you can see how um, how inconsistent those totals are in the hatch years. The, the numbers are really variable. So it really depends on the breeding season, whether the conditions are good, if there's enough food, we might have a really successful year in one year and then have a really poor year the next. Whereas the after hatch year is much more steep, doesn't increase and decrease as much. Uh, orange head warbler, it's pretty similar, but actually the after hatch here is a little bit less stable than the great camper. Uh, okay, next slide. So that's kind of a, a look at some of the data that we collected and how that data can be used. Um, of course, all of this wouldn't be possible without our volunteers. So we want to thank everybody who came out this year and in past years as well. So 2021, 20, 44 different volunteers contributed almost 600 hours. 57 out of our six, 76 days at the station. Um, so these are just some photos of people that helped us this year. Uh, our volunteers do all sorts of good things from uh, extracting from mist nets, setting up equipment, beginning of the season helping us clear the net lanes. When we get to the station, it's basically a giant load of snow being in the air during the off season. So it grows all, everything grows back in and we have to be wiped and clear and unload again. Uh, and we also have some volunteers that are trained to Banding and measuring data. And we also have people that come into the census that I have talked about over there as well. So, without all these volunteers, we certainly wouldn't be able to follow the work that we do. Um, and then, kind of getting near the end here. So, if you want to support us, you can follow us online. We're at Basketball Lake Birds on Facebook and Instagram, where we post regular updates uh, during the banding season. We're not as active during the off season, but Every now and then we do post some interesting stuff about birds and articles that might come out or, or other helpful things that you can do to help birds in the world. Uh, as well, our website is vlbo.wordbirds.com where we have a blog that I update uh, weekly as the season progresses. And then if you'd like to donate, you can uh, do that online through OSCA's website. So it's just OSCA.org. You can make a donation button and then you can, uh, through Canada Helps, you can donate there. Next slide, and that's it. I'll just quickly thank our, kind of our sponsor. So, of course, Oscar, the Open Conservation Alliance, they're the organization that 
oversees the station, they, they kind of channel the funding and everything like that. Um, we are mostly funded by the Bini Wildlife Service, which is the Department of the Federal Government, um, Birds Canada as well, through the, the Great Canadian Bird Zone, and then all of the ones the public well has donated uh, in, in the past. Yeah, so that's it. Thank you. <laughs>